Hello everyone and welcome to um, another session of ZK white Whiteboard Sessions and uh, today uh, I'm here with Alexander from uh, Polygon ID and we're going to be talking about the centralized ZK identity and how zero knowledge proofs fit into that. So, hello Alexander. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So, um, let's start out with giving a bit of context like how do you think about identity and you know what different types of identity are there like uh, just to set the context for, for the conversation. Yeah, so there is two big groups of uh, identity. We can say that there is physical identities. It, it would be like uh, passport, driver license, diploma, maybe some, some other paper, paper documents, basically. Okay. And a big uh, other group is digital identities. So, with digital identities, we have different subgroups. We can say that uh, it, it was an evolution of uh, digital identities. And first one was siloed identities, or we can say centralized ones. And I guess, what would be an example of a centralized identity? So, for example, you have a website and you have login and passwords there. So it's, it's a type of centralized identity when you have just, uh, for each website, you have your own login and password. It's kind of like an account on the website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, can, we can think of uh, digital identities as an identifier or account, and then some data uh, that we can say it's a, it's a claim, uh, that is uh, statements about this identity. Okay. Uh, the next uh, step was in, in evolution of digital identities, uh, federated identities. So, idea is that uh, users don't want to have for each website new login and password. It, it's much easier to have just one, for example, uh, to use a Facebook account or okay. use a Google account to log in to different websites, different applications, and uh, just uh, not to have to remember uh, uh, passwords for, for each website. Yeah. And I guess you also don't have to like type your name every time, it just copies over, gets copied over from Facebook yeah, so and you know, things like that. It's uh, uh, this feder federated identity providers, they're giving a lot of data, they're storing it on their websites, it, it's like uh, your name, picture, uh, email address, maybe some, some other data, could be your uh, social security number, could be passport data, data and so on. So, and uh, the main next step that we, we uh, are gonna talk today uh, a lot is uh, self sovereign identities or we can say decentralized identities and so like just to unpack the term a bit what does self sovereign mean like what what is the dif what is the difference between let's say centralized federated and so self sovereign like or even just federated and self -so sovereign what is the main difference yeah, main difference is that uh, you are in control of your own data. So it's not uh, centralized in some database of, of this uh, one identity provider, but it's on your phone, on your devices. And then you're sharing it with, with others on, on request. So in a way, I would say this is probably somewhat similar to physical identity because there, I guess you also own the data, like you own the passport and whatnot. Is that is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, uh, it's very similar in the way that you're bringing your identity with you and showing uh, one only when you need it. Okay, makes sense. And I think you kind of got start to get into it, but I'm curious, what are the pros and cons? Like you mentioned, this is an evolution, so I'm assuming every subsequent step is better, but even if you compare it to physical ones, um, what are the benefits or like the downsides of using one uh, form of identity versus another? So for uh, physical documents, uh, they have 
pros and cons like with any identity. Uh, you can uh, easily lose your documents if, if we are talking about downsides. Uh, documents could be forged. Uh, they could be destroyed or you can just forget them at home when you are driving your car and you need to show driver's license and it's not with you. So that, that's downsides, but uh, the good thing that uh, uh, good property that uh, we want in digital identities also is that uh, issuer of this document doesn't know uh, where we are using it. Okay, so there is some degree of privacy. Yeah, some degree of privacy, but still the verifier, the one who is looking at your identity, for example, it could be policeman or it could be just a uh, shop assistant or something. So uh, in many cases, they don't need uh, the full documents, full information from, from this document. They just need to know that you are over 18 or you have permission to enter something or you have a license maybe to do something. Yeah, so. and I guess giving out a document like reveals all the information in the document or at least most of it. Like, I think yeah. The driver license in the US, you actually have your uh, address uh, encoded so, or actually written down there. So it's not ideal to show it to a store clerk whenever you want to buy something that requires your age check. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so that is pros and cons of physical. Uh, let's move on to digital now. Yeah, uh, regarding centralized uh, identities, uh, siloed, uh, we can say that uh, only the issuer or the website itself actually, who is uh, giving you access to, to the data knows that it's correct. So it's not easy to port this data to other places. Just showing a picture from a website doesn't prove anything. So you, you can uh, not prove that you have balance uh, on, on your bank account just by showing uh, um, uh, it's on website. So with, with uh, federated identities, it's uh, possible. Uh, so data is stored on centralized uh, servers and uh, uh, you give access to it to others. It could be, uh, as we talked, uh, your profi profile picture, your name, could be your bank statement. Um, yeah, but the thing is that uh, the issuer uh, is storing this data on its uh, servers and it's uh, tracking where you are using it first. And also um, identity provider could just uh, stop servicing you. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, it, if you have forgot your password, so password, uh, you just cannot use it anymore, or you, for any any other reason, you may um, be blocked from a platform. Yep, I guess. Well, so to go back to privacy, for example, it seems to me that federated identity versus physical situation is kind of reversed. There, the verifier can see data they shouldn't see. Here, I guess you can have the verifier maybe given like select access to a given field, but here the issuer can see everywhere you use it, right? So like right. It's, it's interesting. And then, um, uh, as you said, um, Facebook can block you for whatever reason, and then if you rely on Facebook to access other services, now you're blocked from all other services. Yeah. For, uh, for so that's definitely not an ideal situation to be in. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, but it's better than centralized, right? Because you don't need to right. copy things uh, right. from every website. <laughs> Still, uh, it's not easily portable between different identity providers. So you may have data on Facebook, you may have data on Twitter, but you cannot just uh, port it to as a third platform to use data from both. It's harder. To Makes do sense. That. Makes sense. But so what is the pros and cons of self-sovereign or decentralized identity? So for decentralized identity, um, uh, user is in a center. Uh, he receives uh, identity claims. 
uh, uh, stores it, uh, them in, in their it, its own wallet. So, and can share whenever he wants and is required maybe to access something or just to publish a uh, tweet or uh, some article. It could be done in a form of a claim. So it it's, could be sort of, it could be a document or it could be just some what I'm saying. Okay, so it seems to me that like self-sovereign identity kind of combines in itself the convenience of digital identity, but also the, the, pro the properties of physical identities as well. So it's kind of best of both worlds almost. Yeah, right. Okay, awesome. So um, you mentioned a couple of times that now claims and identities, uh, like what are the different pieces of identities? What are claims and how do they fit in? And like we have issues, verifiers, like could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So we, we have, we call this triangle of trust. Uh, we have a user. We have issuer. And we have verifier. Mm -hmm. And uh, between the issuer and verifier, we have a link, it's not direct, but it's, it's a trust. So we can say that uh, for this to work, we need uh, a verifier to trust issuer. And uh, so like in the case of passport, for example, I trust that like US government has issued the passport if the passport has been forged that they, you know, the date of birth is correct on the passport because US government has verified it or something like that. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, checked with uh, just if, if it's a physical document, you can check that it, it looks good. It looks original, not forged, uh, but with digital identities and uh, self-sovereign identities, you can be sure that it's a correct one just by checking digital signatures. Yep. So uh, in our case, uh, user, let's say uh, we have university as an issuer, receives a claim about uh, finishing some classes or courses. It would be a diploma or something. And uh, it would be a claim issued from the university to the user. Okay. So we, we have this claim sent to, to the user. And then when user comes to employer, he wants to show that he, he has some knowledge, he has some trainings done, and he can present uh, this claim to the verifier. But in our system, we, we don't want to reveal the whole data. If verifier doesn't need whole data from, from this claim, we can just say that, yeah, we have license and it's correct. And for that, we are using zero knowledge proofs. Okay, so this is where ZK comes in. So basically, this is called a claim, right? From something that is issued from the uh, uh, issuer to the uh, to the user. And is there a term for this uh, side, or is it also just verifying a claim or something like that? Yeah, it's uh, verifying. Okay. Claim. And uh, one other thing to ask: um, in this case, so we've been talking about the user as being a physical person, is that how we should think about it? Or could a user be like some I don't know, yeah. machine, robot or whatever? Or how do, uh, like, is, do we always want to tie identity to a physical user basically, or a person? Yeah, you're right uh, yeah, that uh, it could be anything actually. Uh, identity and it could be belonging to a user, to a physical natural person. Or it could be a room, it could be city, it could be organization. So, and it could be just a pen. Okay, <laughs> I, makes sense, makes sense. 
Um, and then, um, as you mentioned here, so just to confirm, the ZK properties, uh, or we use ZK proofs in self sovereign identities to um, make sure we hide some information, right? Yes. So. And um, it only makes sense in the self sovereign context. Like for a federated identity, you don't really need a ZK proof, right? For example, because the, there is other ways to hide information in that context. There are some ways uh, if uh, identity provider, federated identity provider supports it. Okay. So if, if it doesn't support, then all the data is exposed. I see. And the and, uh, user cannot do anything uh, with it because in this case, verifier goes directly to the issuer without user. A user only gives permission to uh, the platform to give his data to verifier. So in this case, verifier goes directly to the issuer and gets this data. Awesome, awesome. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, in our case, um, for this zero knowledge proofs to work, uh, we need uh, some uh, public data and, uh, and some private data. Um, yeah, so I guess in the context of self-sovereign identity, um, you know, we talked about ZK uh, proofs, but also I understand there is a blockchain aspect to it. Like, how does blockchain tie into all of this? Yeah, so we have uh, here blockchain. To store anchors of uh, these claims on chain. So for this trust uh, link to work, we need uh, identities of issuers to be published on chain. And these identity states of, of issuers, they are including claims and in our case also revocations. So when Verifier receives this zero knowledge proof of uh, some statement, he also needs to go to blockchain and check that data referred uh, in this zero knowledge proof is correct one and is on blockchain. And so um, kind of like to compare with federated and centralized identities, basically instead of using a central database to store the data, we're using blockchain, but we don't store the actual data on the blockchain. We store kind of like the commitments to the data, you call them those anchors, right? Yeah, right. So it's uh, commitments and um, the actual data is stored on the user's device uh, in, in a form of claims. And uh, of course, uh, users' public-private keys are stored also on, on the user's device. Okay, makes sense. And then um, I'm just curious, I know, let's say blockchains don't have high throughput and all of that stuff, at least right now, we are working on fixing that. Uh, but for now, uh, and that could be a challenge when you need to verify many or update claims periodically. So. Uh, if we talk about challenges with the system, so like I'm guessing throughput is one, but what, what other challenges are there? Yeah, it was a big challenge for us uh, to solve and we found a way with um, building a Merkle tree of claims and then publishing only the Merkle tree root on chain. Okay, I guess we'll get into the exact architecture in a few minutes, but yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Any other challenges in terms of besides throughput, or is that the main thing that... Uh... Yeah, when we are talking about blockchain, uh, we need always to think about cost also. Like, with this scalability, we are also solving this cost problem. Okay. And I guess using ZK solves the privacy uh, aspect, and okay. And one of the challenges we wanted to solve was ability to use this not only uh, outside of blockchains, this identity and claims, but also on-chain. So that, that's a big uh, problem we wanted to solve and we solved it. Okay, makes sense. Actually, uh, one other question that I, I have about this. So if we talk about like this is now the full system and you mentioned a few times like there is a revocation, like what, what are the properties? So a user can get a um, claim from the uh, issuer uh, and then the claim kind of within the user but you also mentioned that 
um, you know, sometimes the claim can be revoked. Like, could you talk a little bit more about like why this is needed or how this is uh, helpful? Yeah, imagine case when you lose your passport and uh, you just don't want somebody to use it and uh, or uh, you lost your phone and it stores your keys, your claims and so on and you need a way to revoke access to it, revoke claims maybe or it could be just, uh, uh, for example, issuer decides to revoke because it's not relevant anymore. For example, a claim could be that you are part of some DAO or a member of some group. If you are not a member of this group anymore, then issuer may revoke this. Okay, so these claims are dynamically updatable yes. and uh, in both directions, kind of like, but only the issuer can uh, revoke their own claims. That's the, I guess, an advantage where. Yeah. In case of Facebook, for example, Facebook can revoke your entire identity. Here, it's much more surgical, uh, kind of uh, what a specific issuer can do. Yeah, it's much more granular. Yeah. Kind of way, yeah. All right. So now let's dive into Polygon ID. What is uh, what is the overall architecture? How um, do you guys implement this specifically, like uh, uh, in Polygon ID? What, what are the di different moving pieces? Yeah, right now I will describe how it's these commitments work, what we are publishing on chain, what stays off chain, and how it's working. So we have issuer, and uh, it has identity and uh, uh, for it to work uh, we need identity state on chain so this is uh, this commitment that we are publishing on chain it's identity state we are calling it so and is it like a merkle tree or is it uh, a hash of something or what exactly is an identity state yeah, identity state is actually a hash of three Merkle trees. The first one is claims Merkle tree. The other one is revocations tree. And third one is roots tree. And it's uh, not very obvious what, what is doing this root tree, but we are adding this claims tree root into root tree, and uh, it allows us to prove different things uh, without having to ask issuer to reveal newest state of Merkle tree. Okay. okay. And uh, so claims are put in, into this tree and it's a binary structure. And we have some fields in it. We have claim schema. We have identifier to whom it was issued. And this claims tree, is it like a map uh, that maps something to a claim or is it just like a, uh, you know, is there like a public key that maps to a specific claim or how does it work? So it, it's a sparse Merkle tree yep. and uh, we are uh, putting each claim in a specific place in this tree. So we have some fields of the claims that uh, we hash together and it makes this pass in this tree. Okay. So. And is that the identifier or is that something else? It's claim schema, identifier and some additional flags. Got it. So, and of course we have data in this claim. And for revocations, it's the same. 
but we are putting here just revocation nonsense. We we have yeah. them in uh, here in in the claims. So each claim has revocation nonce, and when we want to revoke something, uh, we need to add this revocation nonce to revocation tree. And the path in this tree would be the same as path in this tree, right? For a given claim. No, it, it will be uh, uh, the revocation nonce will be used as a path. Okay, I see. And regarding roots tree, so we are putting the updated uh, roots here, adding from time to time. Like each time we are publishing. So it's kind of like a historical already. record of the yeah. claim trees. Uh, so it, it's a living tree. We are always adding new claims there. Same for revocation. Uh, we are updating it. And uh, for, for the claims, we are adding this uh, claims tree root to, to this roots tree. Okay, this makes sense. Now, um, this gets recorded on a blockchain, right? Um, right. And um, what is the, like, who, who does the updates? How does that work, if you could explain it? So, we have a smart contract on chain that verifies a state transition. So, it's a special uh, circuit that we have that checks that it's actually uh, identity uh, who calls keys are updating uh, is updating this uh, state on chain and it could be more complicated in the future like we can uh, in the future check that for example claims were not removed from this tree or revocations were not deleted and uh, more complex maybe mm, yeah state transitions. I think it might be helpful to go through like maybe an example of how um, a user would use a system to like let's say I want to get a claim like I want some get a claim from some issuer and then I want to use it somewhere how would this work uh, you know yeah so imagine we have this university so university uh, has uh, is running an issuer and updating these identity states and claims. So diploma would be of schema diploma, for example. Then identifier would be user's uh, identity. And the data that is actually grades and so on. And uh, uh, issuer puts it in his Merkle tree, but also uh, it signs it with uh, with a digital signature. It it has keys and actually uh, keys of public key of of the issuer lives also in this tree somewhere as a claim. Mm -hmm. So we have actually two types of claims. It's kind of self claims and also claims that identity is doing towards another identity. And one question that actually I didn't think about before is, so this identity state, is that, does each issuer create a separate identity state for their claims or do all the claims from different issuers are uh, in the same identity state or how, uh, like if you were saying a university wants to do it, would the university create a different smart contract which stores uh, a separate identity state only for this university or uh, does it somehow get merged across different issuers? Uh, all, all the issuers are using the same smart contract and they are updating identity states uh, there, but uh, each issuer has its own chain of identity states. So uh, I have mentioned uh, state transition function mm -hmm. and for uh, each identity state, here it is checked that this transition from previous state to a new one is correct. And it is the same for different issuers as they are running in parallel. Okay, so uh, the identity states like uh, are in the same smart contract, but let's say Cambridge would have one uh, identity state and then uh, Harvard and Stanford would have other identity states and so forth. And obviously for uh, other types of issuers, you would have you know, also different identity states. Okay, yeah. makes sense. 
And uh, I guess there is logic that enforces that if I'm Stanford, I cannot update Harvard's uh, uh, identity state. And yeah, like that. yeah. So it's checked inside this uh, uh, state transition function. Yep. Makes that, sense. That is actually also zero knowledge circuit. So in in future, it could be more complicated. For cases like DAO, you would like to uh, maybe uh, have different actors uh, doing on behalf uh, of the, uh, this identity doing some claims. I actually would like to come back to it later about like how zero knowledge fits into this, but let's finish the example first. Yeah, so diploma uh, as a claim uh, would be added to this uh, tree of claims and then uh, it will be sent to the device of, of user. Actually, user will fetch it from, from the issuer. So and the issuer would submit a transaction that updates a, a smart contract on, uh, on chain that has this uh, new commitment to the claim, but the actual data the, the issuer would give to the user's uh, you know, device or whatever, and that's how it gets stored. Okay. Yeah. And uh, at the moment when uh, we have this published uh, on chain, user can now prove that he has this uh, claim and he can generate proofs by, based on this. But what happens if we, uh, if uh, issuer doesn't publish it quickly? Like, should I wait for 10 minutes or one hour until it's published on chain? So for, for these cases, we have actually digital signature that we can use uh, signature from the issuer to immediately use this kind of claims uh, without waiting until it's published on chain. I see. And we we um, it, it's the same more or less level of security, but when it's published on chain, it has additional properties like we can prove that uh, this claim wasn't uh, issued just now we can prove uh, that it was uh, added at some point and also we can prove that it is a unique uh, claim for example if we have a competition and we want only one identity to receive claims that he's a winner of com this competition so with merkle trees and Merkle tree proofs, we can prove that this is unique claim and uh, uh, prove such kind of things. Okay. And I'm guessing also, if you just rely on signature, you can prove revocation. So like if you want to prove that the claim was revoked, you do need to do a uh, check against the Merkle tree. Is that right? Uh, regarding revocations, it, it works the same with Merkle tree proofs and the signature proofs. So when issuer needs to revoke something, he adds revocation nonce to, to the tree and then needs to publish it uh, uh, on chain. And from that moment, uh, it's not possible uh, to use this claim anymore. And it doesn't matter if it was uh, Merkle tree proof of inclusion into this tree or it was signature proof from from the I see so even when you uh, try to use a claim uh, using a signature you still need to include a proof that it is not part of the revocation tree yes okay got it um, another question is um, I'm assuming you know this the state rules change all the time so if I have this data how do I know against like when I generate a proof how do I know against which state route to generate my proof uh, so that uh, do I need to keep all the data or kind of continuously monitor the updates or how does it work yeah, so uh, this part, uh, the tree itself, is uh, private and it, it's not published anywhere, but the revocation tree, roots tree, it, it should be public. It should be accessible to everyone together with claims tree root. So uh, with that, uh, identity could go and check uh, that uh, its claim wasn't revoked by just fetching this revocation tree and fetching the correct path uh, to, to the revocation nonce. And actually, 
it doesn't need to fetch the whole tree and even the whole path just because it's not changing too much it would be maybe just a few levels that needs to be fetched and then hashes would match and that's also uh, a privacy feature okay so the expectation is that the user needs to know about this they before they can generate a, a proof of the some claim um, they need to get this data from somewhere right and then for this this is known only to the issuer uh, is that right okay and when issuer uh, creates the claim and sends uh, to to the user uh, he also sends a uh, merkle tree proof of inclusion into this tree uh, to to the user and also signature proof okay. like, like it's just digital signature together with, with the claim and later we can prove that uh, it's uh, included uh, into this merkle tree uh, in in two different ways one is just uh, having reference to some older state of the issuer that is published on chain and with this uh, Merkle tree proof of inclusion uh, into the tree and together with this uh, two, two other roots we can hash them together and get identity state that is on, on chain but it reveals a bit of information at least when this claim was issued and sometimes you don't want to say uh, that uh, when it was issued because maybe it was only one claim issued at the time maybe a small group and then uh, it could be possible to reveal your identity and for such things we are actually using this roots tree so you always can uh, reference to the claims tree root in this tree and always uh, generate proofs that are going to the latest state of the uh, issuer makes identity. Sense. Makes sense. Uh, so now we understand how the system works more or less. Um, and it seems to me that you know you don't necessarily need to have zero knowledge proofs everywhere. You can you know verify signatures, you can provide proofs via Merkle paths, but um, obviously you mentioned zero knowledge proofs several times and uh, I'm curious which parts of the system are they used for and for what purpose? It is used for, for privacy. We want to hide some data. We can generate uh, proofs of some statements that are not directly inside the claims. Like age, we could compute it from date of birth, for example. And also, we can do authentication on some website or uh, inside the application without revealing your um, identity, your claims and uh, just proving that it, it is the same identity uh, coming to this application. So basically, instead of you know, a user giving a Merkle path to uh, some verifier um, who wants to verify some claim, uh, and then the verifier going and looking into these trees or uh, being able to retrieve data from there, what we do is uh, the user generates zero knowledge proofs and for, like, they do the work, they look up the data, they make sure that it's not revoked and all of that stuff and then they give that proof to the, uh, to the verifier. Right. Okay. And you also mentioned that zero knowledge proof is used here uh, for some purpose. What is that for? Uh, it's to control that uh, identity is uh, doing state transition in a correct way. So it uh, could be very complicated uh, rules that wouldn't fit uh, in just a smart contract uh, some code. So it could check that you have claim, for example, that you are allowed to transition the state or it could be some some other logics here. So those proofs would be generated by the issuers, is that right? Yes. So when, whenever they update this, uh, the identity state, they would need to generate the proof that they didn't, you know, try to cheat and, you know, removed somebody for with no reason or added somebody twice or whatever. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. All right, now I'm um, really curious about the circuits that you guys are using. Um, first, uh, let's start with the, the ones that the user uh, kind of uh, uses to generate their proofs. Yeah, uh, so we can draw it in a 
simple way the, the circuits. So we have zero knowledge circuit. And it has some inputs. Some of them are public inputs. And we need them to verify that uh, uh, commitments are correct, that uh, it, it should refer uh, data that is on chain or parameters uh, that we are proving, for example, age, something that we need to verify on, on side of the verifier. And private inputs. And for private inputs, we are actually providing this uh, the claim itself and also Merkle tree proof or uh, signature proof that it was issued. And uh, we are providing uh, proof that uh, revocation uh, wasn't, revocation nonce wasn't included into the issuer's uh, revocation tree. And uh, on the output, we have the proof, ZK proof. And with that, with, with public data and zero-knowledge proof, verifier can check that uh, the statement is correct and data is published uh, on chain, the anchors, and be sure that uh, user is following the requirements that this verifier sets. So like to run through an example, maybe to the university or checking age, like what would be, let's say, public and private inputs in, the, in a concrete example? Mm -hmm. So, for example, on computing age, we would uh, provide the claim as one of the inputs that has uh, day of birth uh, data. And inside this circuit, we are doing computations and we can, we can do a few different operations. We created um, generic circuits to do some basic mathematical stuff and uh, just, uh, for example, we can check equation of some data field. We can check that it's less or greater than some value that we want or it's uh, in the list, for example. If you want to make sure that, uh, for example, country of residence is in the list of allowed ones or not in the list, like blacklist of countries. And uh, um, these operations are going as uh, public inputs and also the value that we want to check against. For example, it could be 18 for age or it could be a list of values for, for these operations. Makes sense. So basically, you know, the operation would be a public input. Let's say if you wanted to verify that somebody is over 21, 21 would be a public input and then, you know, maybe type of claim would be a public input as well, yes. so that you know what you're checking against. Uh, and then the claim itself would be private input, I guess. And then, um, like, something about revocation should be a private yeah. input as so well. As a private input, we would provide non-revocation proof. Mm -hmm. And also proof that claim was uh, correctly issued. It, it could be a signature mm -hmm. or it could be Merkle tree proof. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now, uh, it's interesting that uh, you provide the operation as one of the public inputs. Why not have like a separate circuit for every different operation or maybe even build it dynamically? The problem is that we don't want to have uh, too many circuits. 
because for each circuit we need to do a trusted setup. Okay, and we, you're using Growth 16 as a proving system? Yeah, we're using Growth 16 and uh, it requires uh, a trusted setup and we want to minimize the need for it. And for that we, we've built a few generic circuits that can do such kind of operations and it covers a lot of cases. Uh, and uh, Verifier doesn't need to have some specific circuit, write it himself or uh, some, some other rely on third party circuits to, uh, to verify some data. Makes sense. So you basically kind of like encoded this in a single circuit and you also standardized the schema so that the circuit works. So like for a given type of claim, you have a given schema. So you know that if you apply this operation to a given schema, then it will, the result should be correct. Right. And also uh, as a, a public input, uh, we are providing uh, identifier of the issuer. Okay. So, and some, some other data that we can reference, like this non-revocation proof and uh, signature that is actually coming from, from this issuer. Okay, so basically what this says is that you know, I have a claim. I have a claim from this issuer that uh, proves that my age is, uh, you know, over twenty-one or something like that. That's kind of the idea, right? Yeah. Okay, makes sense. So this, uh, so we get the zero knowledge proof in the end, and uh, I think you mentioned earlier that um, you know there are two different ways to use it. Uh, could you explain this a bit more? Yeah, so with this ZK proof, we can prove something off-chain, obviously, like we can uh, log in, for example, uh, to a website and prove that uh, we are allowed to do something on this website, like to vote for some uh, in cases like DAO or something, we can vote for proposals. And this is the off-chain use? Yeah, it's okay. off-chain use. But it could be implemented also on-chain. If you want to do the same on-chain, and uh, it would be a smart contract that is receiving zero-knowledge proof, and then you would be, would be allowed to, to do some actions inside uh, this uh, smart contract, like vote or withdraw funds or some, some other actions. And I guess this is probably one of the reasons why you need to go with Growth16 because if you want to post proofs on chain, they should be fairly small. You can go with some other system that may be a bit more flexible here, but then the proofs would be much bigger. Yes. So it was one of the restrictions we wanted to uh, proofs to be usable on chain. But uh, the other um, thing is that we want proofs to be uh, generated on mobile phones. And Gross 16 allows us to do this uh, pretty quickly. And how, how much time does it take to generate like an average claim proof, I guess? Yeah, we are working on optimization, but right now it's about five seconds to generate the proof. And we are working and I think it will be uh, about one second to generate the proof. Okay, that's, that's really good. Uh, and I guess um, that leads me to another question. So. Um, besides optimizations, what other things are you guys working on or trying to build into Polygon ID in the future? Yeah, one of the things uh, is also extending this query language to support more operations, do more complex uh, stuff, uh, optimization, as I mentioned. And also we are bu building um, a platform so that issuers would be able to just call it regular APIs to issue claims, to uh, do all the stuff without needing to manage the keys themselves and so on. It's, it's just for ease of use. And uh, of course, you, uh, issuers could run uh, our node and uh, do it themselves. Also, we are building a testation platform. Polygon Verify is uh, such source of trust uh, in the beginning uh, we are doing we can do KYC we can do some some other stuff 
and uh, this is uh, very useful for different applications to provide civil resistance, to provide for regulated applications, uh, prove that uh, this person was checked against AML, KYC regulations. And uh, we, we are working on, on this different... Interesting. So in this case, would Polygon be considered an issuer or how does it work? So Polygon Verify is an issuer. Okay. But we are aiming to bring much more different issuers, KYC providers, social media. User himself should be able to issue claims about others and uh, about himself. Interesting. Okay. Well, very exciting. Well, I think uh, this was a great session. Thank you so much, Alexander. Thank you.